So I originally never intended to make this video. Over the course of making the previous four, I became slightly soured to Chilla's Arts games. I felt their output was, for the most part, declining in quality. That they were choosing to push out games with alarming frequency and not allowing time to address issues that had been present in their works. I had truly enjoyed some of their games, but the amount that I felt were mediocre or outright terrible was becoming more common. Because of this, I had decided to end my journey of reviewing their games, which you can tell I obviously didn't stick to. I'm not sure what drew me back. Maybe it was people speaking highly of the games released after part 4 came out, or maybe I'm just addicted to Chilla's Arts games and will never truly escape them. Who knows? All I know is that I'm back on the Chilla train and I'm taking you all along with me. So sit back, order an overpriced tea and crisps from the trolley lady, and join me as I take a look at the next few games from Chilla's Art. Oh, heavy spoilers for everything going forward, so if you feel like trying a game for yourself within the first few minutes of a review, feel free to skip to the next one. Just a quick content warning for this one. This game does include themes of sexual assault, so if you'd like to avoid that, feel free to skip to the next game with the timestamps below. I usually don't include content warnings in my videos since, you know, it's a horror channel, what do you expect? But things like sexual assault make me more uncomfortable than death and ghosts, so I thought to include it in this case. The karaoke's intro is narrated with actual proper voice acting, which as far as I recall is a new thing for Chilla's art games. It's a solid performance that draws you into the story right away. The ominous and cold line reading sets the tone immediately and if I wasn't already aware that I was playing a horror game, this would make that fairly evident. The girl you play as, Mira, joins her classmate Moeka in the school's gymnasium to practice some basketball. They intend to do karaoke afterwards, but who can resist the urge to switch some three-pointers with nobody around to judge your failure to do so? After embarrassing themselves for a while, the coach enters the hall and reprimands them for staying so late. Moeka tells you to go on ahead to the karaoke place while she cleans up, so we leave her behind. After getting out of our sports attire in the changing room, we cycle down the street to the venue. It was pretty cool being able to cycle through the foggy nighttime streets and thankfully the bike handles a lot better than the car in the radio station. Usually you only have your feet to help traverse the creepy environments, but on this bike you can zoom through them at a decent speed. There's less tension in one way because you no longer feel like something could be stalking right behind you and that you're too slow to outrun it. But there's more tension in another way, or I guess you could call it apprehension, because you could be unknowing speeding straight into danger. It's cool, I like the bike. At some point a van emerges from a side street and seemingly follows you for a short time. It stops pretty quickly though, so you're left wondering if it really was after you or if you're just overthinking things. If you take too long to reach the karaoke place, which I did because I got lost as fuck in these streets, a foreboding piece of music begins to quietly play in the background. It's not entirely immersion breaking either because it sounds a lot like a wind chime swaying in a gentle breeze. It works perfectly to strengthen the already moody atmosphere. During the cycle, Moeka calls and lets us know she'll be a little longer, having been stopped by the coach. We continue on and arrive at the karaoke place. Something to note is that the van we saw earlier is now parked outside the venue. Inside, we are unenthusiastically greeted by a lady at the counter and we book our room for two people. Before entering, we get another call from Moeka. This time, she's clearly in distress and urging someone not to come closer. Now, obviously, she's talking to the coach. Nobody playing this isn't going to instantly realise she's in danger. Mira, however, continues through the room to get her karaoke on. I actually tried to leave the venue to go help Moeka after receiving the call, but the game didn't let me. It seems we're forced to play as a blissfully ignorant character in this game, which is kind of annoying. Oh well. I guess if we're soon going to find out our best friend has been possibly murdered, we might as well have some fun beforehand. I was delighted to discover that you actually do get to play karaoke in this game. Well, it's a rhythm game like the karaoke mini games in the Yakuza games, and I'm a huge fan of those, so I was very happy with this addition. Unfortunately though, I suck at this karaoke mini game. It's just something about the timing or sensitivity of the key presses that I have a hard time with. It's not a majorly important part of the game though, so I'm not going to spend like 10 minutes analysing it. Oh, it does have cute cat background visuals though, which are nice to look at if you're good enough to do so without destroying your score. After either singing your heart out or poisoning everyone in the building's eardrums, you head to the foyer for a drink. On the way back is a tall man blocking the hall. He stares at you with piercing eyes and you're forced to take a detour back to the booth. On the table inside, you find another drink that someone has placed there. It's strange, but we have songs to sing and best friends being murdered to ignore. 
Having butchered another J-pop song, Mira decides to order food for her and Moeka and calls up reception. We give our order and the 2-3 minute wait gives us just enough time to squeeze in another song. During this one, however, we're interrupted by the creepy tall guy when he suddenly enters the room, only to exit again just as quickly. Don't worry though, it's not enough to deter Mira from continuing with her karaoke session. After the song, our food still hasn't arrived, so we go to reception to get it. The employee is missing, but we find her in the staff room. She gets mad at us, which is fair because we are trespassing, and tells us our food has already been delivered. Returning to our room, we see the tall guy running out of there and a plate of fries on the table, which is the wrong order. It seems either the woman was too engrossed in her phone that she flubbed our order, or the man swapped our food with his so that he could sneak a message to us inside one of the fries. I actually tried to contact this email address, hoping to receive a cool reply from the in-game character, but alas, I was met with disappointment. At this point, I felt the game was building tension really well. Each of the interactions with the tall guy have increased in creep factor with him crossing further boundaries each time, to a point where you don't know what he'll do next. During the next song, the TV starts to show distressing imagery and the audio distorts, completely ruining the fun vibes. Moeka calls again, this time sounding sad and defeated. She notifies Mira that she won't be attending the karaoke session and hangs up. The power goes out in the building and you start to find mobile phones identical to Moeka's in the hall. After picking up the last one by the front door, Moeka appears outside with eyes crying blood. She questions Mira's lack of response to her quite obviously concerning calls before backing away into the shadows. We return to the karaoke room and Moeka erupts from within, scaring Mira into unconsciousness. She wakes up again and the lights are back on. Mira's phone rings on the floor and it's Moeka again, this time sounding a lot less sinister. She warns us that the person she sent a photo of saw her do it and he's now after us too. Mira feels sick and heads to the bathroom. While in there, she checks her phone and sees the photo Moeka sent. The image is blurry, but you can clearly make out the visage of the coach, his eyes darkened to emphasise his evil nature. Moeka is no longer answering her phone, so we leave to notify the employee. She's nowhere to be found and the front door has been blocked by the coach's pickup truck. The security cameras in the staff room show the coach entering the building through the back door and thus begins a stealth section that will have you sneak through the halls while trying to avoid the coach. You have two choices here, you can either wait the 4 minutes until the police arrive or you can deal with the coach yourself, by stabbing him in the back with the knife you retrieve from the janitor's closet. As decent as this game has been so far, this is where it falls apart completely for me. First of all, for seemingly no discernible reason, the halls are now filled with patches of glass that will alert the coach to your presence if you step on them. I have no issue with this mechanic, it's just the fact that there's no explanation for how all the glass got here in the 20 seconds you spent inside the staff room. Also, there are now several piles of furniture acting as blockades to prevent you from flanking the coach too easily. I actually backed up into one of these on my first attempt, thinking I could just scoot around the corner away from him, but ended up being caught almost instantly because I had unknowingly backed myself into a corner. These blockades turn what used to be a number 8 shaped hall into a letter H shaped hall making the centre path the only way to get from one side to the other. This makes it extremely difficult to avoid the coach. The developers did include the ability to hide under tables in the rooms, but those aren't very reliable in my experience. So basically, it's not a very good stealth section. The one good thing about it was that the coach's taunting could be incredibly chilling as he stalks the hallway, although there aren't any subtitles, so I didn't know what he was actually saying. If you choose to stab him in the back, he will die on the way to the hospital and Mira will be racked with guilt for years to come. A cutscene shows Mira driving past the school some time later and seeing the coach, or the apparition of the coach, watching her from behind the gates. It seems, although his life was ended, his evil lives on. That's only one of the endings though, and I usually don't do this, but I'm going to discuss the rest of the endings because they're actually more interesting. This is also an attempt to present and analyse these games to a fuller capacity than I sometimes have in the past because I couldn't be bothered to explore the alternate endings. I do apologise for not going to the effort of doing this with those games, although I'm not including Akamanto and yuki -Ona in that apology. Screw those games. Anyway, I mentioned earlier that you can try to wait it out until the police arrive and if you do, they will apprehend the coach. It's revealed that he sexually assaulted more than 10 students, with Moeka being his last. She's not mentioned in the stabbing ending, but Moeka survives the ordeal, but is severely traumatised. We can assume it's the same ending for her in both situations, because there's nothing that would change between the two. The rest of the endings though are quite different, and the requirements to achieve them are a lot more obscure. 
Thankfully, after beating the game once, you are shown images of items or locations that will help you down the different narrative paths. The key to each of these is to first inspect the clock upon entering the gymnasium. You can then notify Moeka that it's getting late and she won't stay behind to clean up, leading to her assault. In the first of these endings, you find a camera that the coach had hidden under the bench in the girls' changing room. He enters after you find it and you get a choice to either confront him about it or to stay quiet. If you stay quiet and leave the school with the intention of handing the camera into the police, he will begin to chase you down the street. Assuming you reach the police station, Mira hands the camera to them and gives her story but ultimately the coach escapes punishment because there was no solid evidence that tied him to the camera. Somehow. Then, due to him being able to continue his predatory practices, Moeka soon becomes one of his victims and later commits suicide. If you choose to confront the coach about the camera, he takes it from you, claiming he'll report it to the school and warns Mira not to tell anyone about it to avoid mass hysteria. He then offers her a lift home and while she's sitting in the passenger seat waiting for him, you can open the glove box and find a folder full of inappropriate photos of girls from the school. At this point, Mira leaves the car to run to the police station and the coach gives chase again. With the camera and the photos, the police have enough evidence to convict the coach and he's taken away to jail. The school hires a counsellor to help the affected students and there are no reports of any of them committing suicide. If you choose not to check the glove box, the game will end with Mira being sexually assaulted instead. She's never able to bring herself to talk about this incident with anyone and it affects her for the rest of her life. Mira hopes for there to be fewer sexual assault victims like her in the world going forward, but since she never shares her experience, it means the coach remains at large. If you leave the school with Moeka and give her the bike lock key she left in her locker, having not interacted with the camera at all, they will both make it to karaoke safely and have a great time. This, at first, seems like the best ending, with both characters escaping harm, but then you realise that with the coach's deeds going unnoticed and unrevealed, he will continue to commit them. The characters of this story may have escaped him, but there will be others who aren't so lucky. These endings are bleak and uncomfortable. Each one has some element of helplessness, whether it be either Moeka or Mira being assaulted, or in the case where neither of them fall prey to the hands of the coach, the unnamed past and future victims of him still exist. There's no happy ending in the story because in all cases, some of the horror has already occurred and the very real and grounded nature of this horror makes it all the worse. This game differs from most chill as art games where the source of the horror isn't paranormal. There's no suspension of disbelief on the part of the player to understand this horror. It very much can and does occur in our everyday world and it's not exactly rare like a haunting would be. Sexual assault, abuse and voyeurism all happen a lot more than people would think, which makes this game feel all the more real to its players, especially those unfortunate enough to have experienced these things. Even outside of the coach, there are examples of this abuse system. The oblivious employee is more concerned with what's on her phone than whatever troubles Mira is experiencing. She doesn't even notice the creepy tall guy stalking Mira within the walls of her own business. Well, it's debatable whether or not she's that inattentive, because she does remember Mira as being the high school girl when she calls. It could very well be the case that she turns a blind eye to the things going on around her, not wanting to get involved because it's too much trouble. The tall guy represents a different kind of predator, one that lurks in the shadows and stalks their prey instead of the more bold tactics of the coach. He gets progressively more daring throughout the night, starting by following Mira in his van and eventually going as far as to drug her. He'll even watch her through the door as she sings karaoke, which is something you might miss completely if you're too invested in the minigame. It's implied that he drugs Mira with the fries, and the following sequence that one might presume is a haunting is evidence of that. At first you might think that Moeka was killed by the coach and is contacting you from beyond the grave, but she doesn't die, meaning it was a dream sequence. A nightmarish dream brought on by a sudden drug-induced sleep. What happens to Mira while she's asleep is unclear, but the tall guy isn't seen again. I swear, this game just gets more and more disturbing the more you think about it. At first, I wasn't a fan of the karaoke. The extremely janky presentation on my first playthrough put me off attempting to see the other endings, but my decision to experience as much of these games as possible to analyse them properly made me keep playing. I'm glad I did too because there was so much more depth to the game than I had originally witnessed. The story is generally presented quite well, although I do have a few gripes. Firstly, I don't like playing as a character who would ignore such an obvious sign that something is wrong. 
In fact, Mira seems to be quite unresponsive to a lot of things going on in this game. It was frustrating to be forced to do karaoke instead of running to help Moeka after that one call and I wish there was an additional ending that let you do so. In a way, I understand why you're not allowed to do this, since the time at the karaoke place is the most fulfilling gameplay wise, but if most players would take action to help Moeka at that moment, I think the game shouldn't pigeonhole them into a path that ignores their desires. A few small things I liked in the game were the outside environments which felt very well realised. I've walked home through quiet nighttime towns and cities many times and it does indeed feel very different to the same locations earlier in the day. There's a certain weird feeling you get when you're the only person walking a street lined with sleepy houses. You feel like you don't belong there and the urge to reach your destination intensifies, which works well in a horror game. I also quite liked the music. When you walk past the occupied karaoke rooms, you can hear the music from inside and each of the songs are a delight to listen to. They don't hit quite as hard as Bakamitai, but having actually decent music in this game was much appreciated. I'm glad they didn't use something weirder and jankier like they might have in earlier games. I didn't mention it earlier, but there's actually a bit of ambiguity regarding the drug-induced nightmare or haunting situation. The one thing that makes me question if Mira was actually haunted or not is that the phones that you find on the ground during the nightmare actually show the photo Moeka sends after the dream ends. There's no way for Mira to dream of the photo, since she hasn't received it yet. So was it a dream or an actual haunting? I don't know. Moeka didn't die, so she couldn't have haunted Mira. But how can the photo in the dream be explained otherwise? The most logical explanation I can think of is that it's a simple oversight by the developers and I'm happy with that. <laughs> Other aspects of the game feel very thinly stitched together and the stealth section is the biggest offender. It just barely works on a mechanical level. The suddenly appearing obstacles make no goddamn sense and the coach's detection system seems very inconsistent. I'm not sure how often his tracking updates but several times I would attract his attention to one area by treading on glass, then move away only to step on more glass but he wouldn't lock onto my new location, instead checking out the room near where I'd previously made noise. There's also this moment, which had me completely dumbfounded. As you can see, I've lured him into the room in an attempt to stab him from behind, but when I try to do this, the two characters teleport to the centre hall for the action to take place. It's so janky, it's almost unbelievable. The karaoke sets out and succeeds at showing that horrors exist outside the paranormal that nobody has to die for there to be a horror story. If anything, the game will be a lot more effective because its themes will resonate with a lot more people than ghost encounters would. The game's story is one of the best Chilla's art have ever written and I hope they continue with this quality going forward. I always expect some level of jank in these games, but I'd prefer for it to be a result of not fully realised innovative gameplay rather than just a lack of polish. The stilted animations and static, barely identifiable facial expressions give Chilla's art games charm and a sense of humbleness, or honesty I guess, which makes them a joy to play. But sometimes they'll include elements that just don't work on a fundamental level, and the stealth section in this game was nearly that. It feels like it needed further testing and refinement, but the rest of the experience kind of makes up for this blemish for me. I'm excited to see what else Chilla's art has for me in the next game. Night security opens in a small city apartment. The protagonist of this story wakes up on his couch with enough time to roam his apartment before heading off to his job as a night shift security guard. The apartment is full of great environmental storytelling. The calendar on the wall and the cake in the fridge tell us his child will be celebrating their seventh birthday when they wake up the next day. The sitting room filled with building blocks shows how loved this child is, that the parents are willing to give them this much space to play in a relatively small apartment. They also hang the child's family drawings on the fridge. It's a loving household, for sure. One thing that struck me initially was how great the game looks and especially how good it runs. I've had issues in the past trying to run Chilla's art games, but they seem to be getting better at optimising for PCs that don't cost 5 grand to build. I am using a better laptop to play this though, so that might have something to do with it. After making sure your wife and child are sleeping soundly, you leave for work. As soon as you enter the building, you may catch a glimpse of a figure rounding the corner at the end of the hall. It's incredibly brief, so it's very easily missable, which is a kind of scare I like in horror games. Inside the security office, you're filled in on your nightly duties and head off to ensure the fire alarms are in working order, that the lights are turned off, the building is clear of its remaining employees and the office doors are locked behind them. A note tells us the previous security guard, Keigo Ochiki, hasn't shown up for his shifts, which is why you were hired. 
On the first floor, 1F, you find a man in one of the offices staring at a blank whiteboard. It seems he's the manager, and not a nice one at that because he has no problem forcing extra work on his subordinates. He leaves and you continue with your patrol. Now, while the game's visuals are great, especially the vibrant cityscape outside the rain-beaten windows, at this point in my playthrough I was starting to get frustrated with its use of some sound effects. These were clearly intended to be ambient noise that might startle a nervous player who jumps at even the subtlest hints of spookiness, but I found them far too loud. Instead of hearing the sound of a door creaking or a vending machine distributing a beverage far in the distance, indicating there might be other presences in the building, the overly high volume just made me assume I was supposed to interact with whatever was making the noise, which wasn't possible. You use the lift to reach 2F and in the woman's bathroom you discover someone in one of the stalls who asks you to keep the light on until she's done. In the office is an out of place CRT which shows a brief clip of an interaction between two employees. They're both off screen but you hear that one of them, assumedly the resident of this cubicle, is still working away at her desk as the other woman leaves for home, seemingly not caring much about her colleague's unfortunate situation. In the other office you find a woman staring at a bookshelf. You know, I'm starting to think that the people at this company aren't the most productive. Anyway, the woman is very forward with the security guard, stating she won't leave until she gets his contact information. I guess he gives it to her because she leaves immediately, but damn, nothing but weird vibes from her already. Inside the office on 3F is another TV, this one showing an interaction between the abusive boss and an employee, probably the same one shown in the TV earlier. While exiting the men's bathroom, a woman can be seen going through the fire exit. She's too far away to catch up to her though, so we'll leave her off. As you turn off the woman's bathroom light, a person in the stall shouts at you, saying she already asked you to leave it on. Weird, I'm sure that was the floor below. No? On 4F, the printer is operating on its own, spitting blank sheets onto the floor below, at least until it prints the image of an unassuming woman. Inside the office is another employee stuck trying to get his workload finished before tomorrow. He seems friendly with the security guard, alluding to a familiarity which makes no sense because this is our first day here. He must be delirious from being overworked. One of the hallway lights on this floor is faulty, so we need to replace it. However, as you stand under it as it flickers between light and darkness, you see a woman with red eyes watching you from inside the nearest bathroom. The haunting sound of her long, drawn out breaths drown out the electrical glitching heard above. She watches you until you're brave enough to open the door, only to find nothing inside. This was absolutely fucking terrifying, I can't lie. Up until this point I was fine with occasionally bumping into employees on each floor. The initial moment of discovering them where my flashlight lit up their exhausted faces was somewhat startling but they always left right away. Now I can't patrol the building without the itching feeling that there's something else here. I didn't want to search the rooms in case I found that entity. I didn't want to turn off the lights because more darkness means an even spookier atmosphere. The way the game gradually builds up the subtle scares until this moment was masterful. And yet, this is only the beginning. When the lift door opens on 5F, you can tell the place is a little… different. All the lights are off on this floor, but the walls are slightly different to lower levels and now have a rougher concrete surface. It's a subtle change, but it certainly adds to the building horror atmosphere. In order to fix the lighting situation, you need to find a fuse. There are none to be found in the offices, but there's a weird wooden door where the fire escape would usually be. You open it to find a grimy stone walls and a floor of blood which lead into a dark maze that twists and turns in physics defying ways. This is supposed to be a fire exit, right? As you push deeper into the maze amidst the echoing drips of what can only be assumed to be more blood, you find the occasional object or piece of furniture that looks more suited to a building site than an office building. In a locker room you find a fuse and begin your journey back to normality. As you do so, in a blink and you'll miss it moment, the entity from earlier can be seen retracting her head back around the corner. She's gone when you turn the corner, but man I'd be lying if I said this didn't shake me. While returning to the fuse box, you begin to hear wet footsteps approach from behind you. At this moment, I just booked it for the electrical room, but when I inserted the fuse, I turned and found a woman in red standing right behind me. You can clearly see how much this fucked me up in the footage. Based on her attire, she's the woman in the photo that was printed earlier. She tells us to flip the four circuit breakers to fix the lights and then leaves. After doing just that, we head to the security room on this floor to check the cameras to ensure she definitely left the building. I guess you can't be too careful what with all the weird stuff that's been going on. The camera feed for 6F shows two women chatting in a dark room. 
which is totally normal. One of them is the woman who asked for her number earlier and she boasts to the other about how she stole her current boyfriend, a security guard from another co-worker. It seems she has a type. Their gossip session is interrupted by a loud noise and the two of them sprint for the lift. The non-homewrecker trips before making it in and is left behind. We then see the bitch running through the halls with lights shutting off one by one behind her and finally entering a room only to have it be splattered with her blood afterwards. The feed then switches to show outside the room we're currently in. The tall, dark entity stands at the door, observing us motionlessly. Of course, it's gone when we look around, thank god. A TV in this room shows us another clip of the woman's experience at this company. This time she overhears her colleagues talking about how lucky they are because they can leave some of their work for their pushover colleague to do. On the desk is a cryptic note left by the previous security guard Ochigi mentioning his shock at an incident he witnessed on the cameras. 6F greets you with a cleaning lady at the end of the hall, doing her best to mop up a concerning amount of blood left by the carnage we just witnessed. She seems pretty out of it though, so I get the feeling she's not handling this task very well mentally. The office on this floor is replaced by what I think was a food hall or a break room. It's full of piles of chairs and not much else. After exiting, the cleaner will drop her mop and stare at you as you lock the doors. She offers no interaction, no dialogue. She just stares at you with a gaping maw. It's really creepy. 7F seems like it doesn't belong in this building at all. It's much more run down than the previous floors and there's construction equipment scattered about everywhere. There are even scraps of yellow police tape left on the floor, possibly evidence that something once occurred here. This floor is home to several puppets that are placed in disconcerting poses. Some are positioned on corners to give you a fright as you enter rooms and others are sitting in the rafters waiting to startle you as you search for a button for the lift. Each one is creepy and they're definitely fucking alive to some extent. At one point you hear footsteps on the metal ceiling above you and it makes it very difficult to search this area when you don't want to break line of sight from the dolls lest they move to a new location to frighten you. With all buttons found you can enter the lift again but in doing so all the dolls spring to life and stare at you from the end of the hall. One even attempts to join you in the lift but fails thankfully. This floor was really weird and I don't really understand the inclusion of the dolls. If anyone can translate this poster it might help but yeah. I'm not mad that they were here because they were genuinely very scary. I'd just like to know more about why they were here. ADEF returns to the less run down yet somewhat grimy appearance of previous floors. A can rolling across the floor draws your attention to the direction it came from and you see the fire exit door close behind someone or something. In the bathroom is a woman crying about how something is not her fault. It's the fault of the people who died. When you exit the bathroom, the door will shut behind you and blood will splatter across its surface. 9F is another one of these floors that looks straight out of a Silent Hill game. It's dark, dilapidated, and from within the shadows, the sound of a pained moan can be heard. This sound in itself was enough to make me incredibly panicked, but the additional ambient rumble that soon accompanied it made me the most scared I've been playing a game in quite some time. The ambient rumble is much like the one heard when entering buildings in Phasmophobia. It's subtle and sounds like blood rushing through your ears in a moment of extreme distress. I love its inclusion here. On the ground we find an employee who claims that every time he's woken up from his sleep, it's us who's responsible. He also asks if his boss is still here and gets annoyed when he finds out he left earlier, even though he said he'd stay until everyone else left. The sleepy man leaves and we continue our increasingly harrowing patrol. After locking all the doors, you notice an entrance to another maze-like hallway. Inside this one are three alarm clock looking things and a key to the emergency exit. On your way out, you're again confronted by the observing entity who disappears around the corner when you approach them. The lift is broken on this floor so you need to use the key you found to access the fire exit. This stairwell has more police tape and the other floors are inaccessible. On 10F, the level of weirdness increases even more with all the furniture stuck to the ceiling. Thankfully, that's as weird as it gets here and we continue upwards. Well, that was the plan until the lift begins to descend at an alarming speed. The walls turn rusted and bloody and the sound of flesh breaking can be heard above. At one point I swear I saw the face of the tall entity as a floor whooshed by and I like to think it was a cheeky Juan reference. The lift comes to a stop after descending far more floors than were in the building originally and we find ourselves traversing a dark hall with Japanese characters written in blood, wriggling all the walls. Again, if anyone could tell me what these say, I'd really appreciate it. Beyond the darkness is a TV illuminated from above by a single light. 
The screen shows the face of the woman in red, who begins walking backwards into the shadows before the tall entity erupts from behind the TV to give us a solid scare. The rest of the hallway lights up now and we can make our way to its end, at which is the start of a new floor, as if we'd just departed the lift. The walls of this unlabeled floor are marred with dried bloodstains, which gives the environment a menacing crimson hue. Inside one office is a circle of computers with a TV and VCR at its center. It needs a cable and you solve a quick puzzle to acquire one. The cable is found in the hands of a deceased security guard, seemingly stuffed into a nearby locker. I think it's safe to assume this is Ochigi. The TV shows some very Skinnamarink-esque shots of various locations throughout the building including offices, a bathroom and even the stairwell. At the end we see the woman in red, whose confession of love is cut off with the video. With this, our character decides he's had enough. Finally, jeez. But as we try to take our leave, we're blocked by the entity who now pursues us instead of running away. The way it slowly moves around the room, towering over everything around it and never taking its eyes off us is so amazingly terrifying that I almost didn't want to flee it, but I guess my desire to not be killed slightly overpowered my love for spooky things. After flanking the entity, you can sprint for the emergency exit and immediately fall to your death. As the security guard lies motionless at the bottom of the several floor high drop, the sound of footsteps is heard approaching. The game then ends and over the course of the credits, we see the security guard's adventure rewind itself to the moment he exits his car. We then see that the information in the top left corner, which was previously just security guard, has been replaced with the name Keiko Ochigi, the man that went missing. So what the hell did that all mean? Well, theories on this appear to be quite varied, but first I'll explore both endings so that we can get a better picture. In ending one, the one I got, the character you play as is revealed to be the previous security guard who went missing. The reason he shows up again is because he is dead and is reliving his last night on the job with some weird time bending elements thrown in there to keep things suspenseful. I believe everyone else in the building is also dead, bar maybe the abusive boss. There are hints that this is the case with each, such as the guy you find on the ground who most likely died from overworking and the flirty woman who you witness being killed on camera again. The note left by Ochigi referencing this incident indicates she and the rest of the characters are reliving their last moments too. I believe the boss is the only one who isn't dead because the tired man says he promised to leave after all his subordinates and gets mad because he left even though the tired man was still there. But the boss did stay true to his word. It's just that he couldn't see any of the others because they're all spirits. An interesting thing to note is that when you check the CCTV at the beginning, you don't see anyone in the rooms, meaning they are indeed ghosts. In ending two, during the chase sequence at the end, there's a number pad at the end of the hall surrounded by many crossed out number combinations. The correct code is Ochigi's daughter's birthday, hinted at by the child's drawing beside the number pad. After entering the code, you are able to access the lift again and upon entering, you wake up in a hospital bed. It turns out Ochigi had been in a coma most likely caused by falling like he does in the other ending. Yet this time he doesn't die and is instead stuck in a nightmare until he can fight his way out, fueled by the desire to reunite with his family. His wife and child approach his bedside, crying but relieved that he's back with them. All is well for a moment until the woman in red reveals herself behind them and a piercing ring invades Ochigi's mind. Does this mean that it wasn't just a dream? As I said, these endings are a little vague and many have interpreted them differently. There are many elements that are left ambiguous and this leads to contrasting conclusions. For starters, the relationship situation is a bit confusing, but what I believe to be the case is that Ochiki had a wife and child at home but cheated on them to some extent with women from his workplace. First was the woman in red, who was seen to profess her love to him, and second was the bitchy woman. The heartbreak as well as the workplace harassment the red woman experienced from then on drove her to commit suicide. She doesn't come back as a malevolent spirit though, instead remaining as a good intentioned spirit stuck in the building. I don't believe the entity actually exists. I think it may just be a manifestation of Ochiki's guilt. It appears before him as a woman who is always watching from afar, judging his actions with wide bloodshot eyes, his worst nightmare. The entity could also be a spirit that dwells in the building though, as we don't see it after he wakes up from his coma. Instead, we see the red woman who seems to be haunting Ochigi specifically and isn't tied to the building. You see what I mean? I think I'm even starting to contradict some of my own theories because it's just that easy with this game, and I like that. 
I like a game that can generate discussion long after its release window, such as Silent Hill 2 or Dark Souls. They build a loyal fan base that's interested and willing to dig as deep as they can into every facet of the game to piece whatever they can together. In any case, even though the concept of both endings are pretty unoriginal, I prefer the first as it provides a much more interesting narrative. The coma ending is kind of ruined by the existence of the woman in red, who ruins the whole it was a dream reveal. Like, so it wasn't a dream after all? Then what is this nightmare I just had to experience? It's a little confusing. Of course, these are just my interpretations of the ending. Feel free to play the game yourself and see what you come up with. I've seen many interpretations and each seems just as plausible as the next. To wrap up on Night Security, I firmly believe that this is the best experience I've ever had with a Chillis art game. Not only is it the type of Chillis art game that I enjoy, but it also had one of the best stories so far. The horror elements are top tier and I love the setting of an office building as each new floor brings new terrors. Throughout the entire game it feels like you're descending, or ascending in this case, into a nightmarish hellscape full of the most depressing aspects of work life. It's great! <laughs> and I actually took very few notes during my playthrough, which is unusual, but it's because Night Security kept me so engaged the entire way through, never letting up on the scares long enough for me to reach for my pen. I have almost nothing negative to say about this game, which is a rarity for chill as art games. Usually there's at least some aspect that I didn't enjoy or a noticeable lack of polish, but nope, Night Security, I would say, is chill as art's magnum opus. And as happy as I am to say that, I hope I'm proven wrong in the future. Parasocial is the next game up and it begins with a young woman called Nina waking up to her ringing alarm. After silencing it, she gets a text from her friend Asuka, who instructs her to eat some leftover food she made. Nina's other recent conversations include one with her mother, who seems to reject her daughter's career as a VTuber, a special offer announcement from Chilla's Coffee, the cafe from the closing shift, and a single text from her ex-boyfriend Rikia, who she then blocked before he could send any more. It's clear that Nina doesn't have many people in her life, and even fewer who treat her well. While heating up the leftovers, I explored the rest of the apartment and noticed this game has actual mirror reflections. It's a bit janky with its low frame rate, but hey, it's the kind of progress I like to see in this series. After eating, we settle down at our desk, boot up the VTuber software, launch the game and start the stream. Instantly upon beginning the game, I was impressed by how well they achieved the feeling of playing a game in real life. You can look around your room with the mouse and control the in-game character with the keypad simultaneously. This impressed me as I fully expected the camera to be glued to the computer screen as we played. This did make me a little concerned as to why we were able to look behind us though. One thing I wasn't impressed by was that the game Nina plays is my arch nemesis Akamanto. Anyone who's watched the previous Chilazar videos of mine knows just how much I despise this game. Luckily it's a very stripped down version of Akamanto, but I still ended up dying pretty quickly. This is a scripted death though, so I'm not as frustrated as I was when playing the original. After hitting the game over screen, a viewer called I Love Nina suggests Nina plays a game they link her. We boot it up and are greeted by a fairly simple screen that reads, Horror Game Only for Senra Nina. It seems this person went to great effort to create a game for their favourite streamer to play and of course, Nina being the friendly streamer she is, she downloads and runs it. The game starts up and actually looks a lot like a typical Chilla's art game. The setting is a small, disgusting apartment with more rubbish bags than items of furniture. On the door is a number pad, which requires a code made from the colour coordinated numbers scattered throughout the rooms. It's a simple game, but the quietly disturbing nature of it leaves an impression on you. After clearing it, praise pours in from Nina's viewers. However, the subject of the flowing messages soon switches from her achievement to mentions of a face reveal. With a glance to her other monitor, she realises the VTuber software has malfunctioned and she is now broadcasting her real face to almost a thousand people. This may not seem like a big deal, but not only do many people prefer to hide their real appearance online to maintain privacy, but it's also somewhat taboo for VTubers to break the immersion of their alternate personas. A text from an unknown number then comes through. It's the user I love Nina, saying that bad things will happen if she doesn't keep playing the games they send her. She blocks them and frantically tells Asuka what just happened, since she's the only person Nina can confide in. Asuka replies, saying they'll have to wait to talk about it tomorrow as she's at work. And then the doorbell starts ringing. A peek through the door reveals nobody on the other side. Yet, as you retreat to the living room, someone pushes a note through the letterbox that says, I'm always watching you. This is escalating rather quickly. The next day, Nina awakens at her desk. 
It seems she stayed up late running antivirus software to figure out if it was the cause of the program malfunction. No luck though. The rubbish needs to be taken out today, so you gather it all up and take the bag outside. It's a nice day. The sun is shining and birds are chirping above the bustling city streets. On our way to the lift, we pass the adjacent apartment, which seems to be undergoing some renovations or something, as plastic sheets spill out into a hall and movement can be heard from within. We pass some people going about their day on the way down, and as we throw our rubbish into the bin, a man approaches it also. He doesn't throw his in though, he just stands beside Nina, breathing heavily and staring at her. Knowing to avoid dangerous situations, we return as fast as we can to the apartment to wait for Asuka to arrive. When she gets here, the two go out for a coffee at a familiar venue. It's nice to be on the other side of the counter this time, for sure. After ordering, we get a few minutes to wander around and listen in on the other customers' conversations. Asuka finally decides on her order and the two sit down to discuss recent events. During this, a man in a shiny jacket starts acting strangely towards Nina before leaving. This moment is brushed off by Asuka though and they head home. When getting in the lift, that same man rushes in and stands facing away from Nina. He doesn't do anything directly, but his presence here is what's so disturbing. He definitely followed us home. Nina starts up a new stream as soon as she gets back and we begin another of I Love Nina's games. This one takes place in the dark streets of a densely packed suburb and the goal is to lead a woman to a red door without getting caught by the police. It actually reminds me a lot of earlier Chilla's art games such as Okairi and Destigmatized Property, which is cool. What isn't cool though are the suggestive messages I Love Nina is sending in chat, hinting that they have definitely been stalking her. After completing this game, Nina ends her stream and goes for a much deserved bath. Side note, these Japanese baths are amazing and I want one in my house. She happily splish splashes about until the wooden floors begin to creak in the hall and when the washing machine turns on just beyond her door, a high pitched ringing floods Nina's mind. The next day, Nina wakes up, having slept terribly. At the door is a note from the apartment manager, Miyamoto, saying to call her if there are any problems. Perfect timing, I must say. Calling them, they reassure Nina that there is nothing to worry about and that any weird occurrences are purely her imagination, but on the off chance that there is, for say, a stalker incident, they can provide consultation. Weirdly specific, but whatever, we've got a stream to do. This next game is set in a convenience store, much like another Chilla's art game. You know, I've got to commend them for how well they reference their older games in this one. It all feels so natural and if you hadn't played any of them, you wouldn't even realise. This game plays the same as the last, but as you figure out your way through the maze, I Love Nina sends another hauntingly invasive message in chat asking if Nina enjoyed her bath yesterday. There's no possible way that they'd know about the bath if they weren't inside the apartment. Suddenly, the TV in the living room turns on, startling Nina. She disregards it with a half-hearted comment about her house being haunted and continues the stream. With the game completed, she ends her stream and goes to make food, only to realise she's all out. I honestly don't know how she lives like this. I mean, she doesn't even have any condiments. Anyway, you can choose to order food or head to the convenience store down the street. Not wanting to leave the house, I went for the delivery option, but the guy who shows up is not only way too fast, but brings the wrong order. He recognises Nina as the YouTuber who got her face exposed and says he's a longtime fan before running off to assumedly ruin someone else's order. With this failure, Nina decides the convenience store is her only option. We pass the building manager on the way out, who asks a few invasive questions regarding Nina's living situation and relationship status. It's not uncommon for people to be nosy though, so we continue on our way. In the store, Nina gathers a bunch of unhealthy snacks and drinks, and while doing so, notices the shiny jacket man observing her from outside. Thankfully, we're not alone this time, as a steady stream of customers enter and exit the store. When we go to leave, Nina's ex-boyfriend Rikia shows up to warn us that Asuka is acting strangely, but the store clerk confronts him before he can say any more. On the way back, the shiny jacket man begins to follow us. The streets go dead quiet apart from a howling wind that sweeps through the tall buildings. We make it back safe, but when the lift stops at an earlier floor, the man erupts from the stairwell to join her inside. He watches her all the way to her apartment, and Nina informs Asuka that she's being followed again. Asuka suggests reporting the incident to the local police box tomorrow and Nina agrees to. As soon as the conversation with Asuka ends, messages start pouring in from Isle of Nina, suggesting she gather as many allies as she can. You then get a choice to unblock Rikia. I did, and we get to press him further about the info he has on Asuka. He sends a photo that shows Asuka talking to the shiny jacket man and gives more reasons as to why he believes she might be behind this. 
Nina instantly blocks Asuka to avoid further manipulation and sits down to do another stream, only to find her computer has been hacked. Her virtual persona taunts her from behind the screen before shutting the PC down. Then, as the PC's internal fan winds down, the sound of tapping can be heard on the window in the front room. Opening the curtain reveals a man on the other side, who runs off, only to reappear at the back door. A chase scene begins where you have to sneak around the apartment while avoiding him. While this is happening, the stream chat on Nina's phone begins to receive messages from viewers as if they are watching her play a game. They hint at the existence of a screwdriver in the closet near the PC, so we make that our goal. With the screwdriver in hand, you can flank the man and stab him from behind. With him incapacitated, Nina exits her apartment, only to be stabbed fatally in the gut by a demonic looking Asuka. Nina then wakes up, and it was all a dream. A bit underwhelming, but at least we're not dead. To the police station we go, and before we can enter, we're approached by a policeman, seemingly returning from a patrol. We ask to talk, and he guides us to a nearby park, saying we'd be too nervous to talk in a police station. Nina explains everything, and he gives her his personal number in case anything comes up. The entire interaction with him exudes weird vibes, which made him seem untrustworthy to me. Back at the apartment, Nina contemplates contacting Asuka. I chose not to because she's a fucking traitor. We start up another stream and this one seems a lot more familiar. In fact, the setting is an exact recreation of the street from the local convenience store to Nina's apartment building. We have no choice but to follow the path to the apartment, the whole time wondering what on earth could happen when we get there. The blissfully ignorant chat feels that something is up and questions if Nina is okay. We enter the apartment and slowly traverse the hall. I couldn't help but look away from the screen to the hall behind me just in case there was someone there and there was! Like you can actually see someone's hand around the corner holding a camera, meaning that this game is actually a live camera feed of someone watching us. Holy fuck is that unbelievably unsettling. The game cuts off when you approach Nina's desk and Nina ends her stream, only to be presented with recorded videos of her at various times over the last few days, including footage of her at her desk, of her bathing, of her sleeping. This is so fucked up. You get a choice on who to call for help. Rikia, the police, or the building manager. I chose the latter as they seem the least untrustworthy. She says she'll be right there and we hide in the meantime. Messages come in from I Love Nina. They're also on their way here. We quickly leave the safety of the closet to grab a defensive frying pan from the kitchen. Messages continue to come in from I Love Nina, counting down to the moment they arrive. Nina's phone dies and she's left alone with no way of getting help. The doors in the apartment can be heard opening as someone searches through each room, and finally, they slide the closet doors open and find us hiding inside. The preceding cutscene shows several people enter the room as Nina lies helplessly on the ground. Rikia then enters and chases them away, saving Nina. With this, the stalker is never heard from again, and Rikia and Nina reignite their relationship, with Nina feeling incredibly indebted to him for saving her. Shortly after, the couple go on a date to everyone's favourite cafe, and while Rikia is in the bathroom, Nina is approached by Asuka. She shows Nina photos of Rikia talking with the man in the shiny jacket, and the game ends with Nina regretting her earlier dismissal of her loyal friend. This is the bad ending, and you have the ability to retry from the point where you chose to believe Rikia or Asuka. This time, we're trusting Asuka. Nina unblocks her and apologises. Asuka comes over to visit, which sets Nina's mind at ease a bit. The two friends talk things out and Asuka explains that she doesn't even know the shiny jacket man, that he just approached her and didn't say anything, obviously just so someone could take a photo of them together. She then sits on the couch while Nina does her stream, being a comforting presence where there previously was none. As the stream starts up though, she announces she's nipping to the shop to get food as Nina has none. Fucking Nina and her shitty diet again, goddamn. She leaves and we're left with the game, alone. Since we now know that this game is live footage, I assumed we'd pass by Asuka, but we don't. The camera continues into Nina's apartment just like before and ends, showing the creepy voyeuristic footage we saw before. This time we have the option to call Asuka for help, but we hear her phone ringing from next door. We investigate and find an elaborate computer setup surrounded by candid photos of Nina. This is where the stalker was hiding out the whole time. Inside the bathroom, we find Asuka tied up, explaining why we didn't pass her in the game. At the sound of someone entering the front door, we escape back to our apartment, only to find the shiny jacket man standing by the PC, wondering where Nina is. We head downstairs and are stopped by the building manager. No time to explain things to her though, so we head outside, only to be stopped again by the cop. We run from him as well and head straight for the police station. 
A later news broadcast reports on the incident where four suspects were arrested for what they did to Nina. It turns out Ricky Ah orchestrated the whole thing, roping in his family members to play the parts of the building manager, the cop and the creepy shiny jacket guy. They all face jail time for their crimes and with everything settled, Nina can finally relax and make dinner for Asuka as thanks. They chat about Nina's plans to move away and put the incident behind her, before mentioning that the developer behind Akamanto recently released a new game called The Convenience Store, which apparently isn't as tough as Akamanto. According to Asuka, the newer game is easier on casual players. Is this fucking game making fun of me? And that's Parasocial, another amazing experience that I wasn't expecting. While it didn't hit the highs that I felt Night Security did, I can admit that that's probably because I prefer paranormal horror as opposed to more real horror. I will say though that this game does a phenomenal job at building suspense throughout and its climax actually follows through, wasting none of the tension it had at its disposal. The way everything in this game contributes to its ending, even when you don't realise it, is amazingly done. The interactions you have with each character leave you with varying amounts of suspicion, no matter who it is. Even conversations with Asuka can arise suspicion, as her comments about waiting until tomorrow to go to the police make you think she might try to do something before then. An element of the game I really enjoyed was the streaming itself. I have no experience with live streaming and minimal experience as a stream viewer, so I probably wouldn't get as much out of this as others might, but I still found it to be very engaging and immersive. The chat seemed authentic as each viewer has their own style of speaking and ways of reacting to what happens in both the game and to Nina herself. The best part of this though are the chat messages from I Love Nina. Their presence in the chat was especially sinister as their messages would only stand out as unusual or concerning to Nina herself. To anyone else they would either seem like they're talking nonsense or that they know Nina personally, yet neither are the case. Chilla's art have gotten very good at exploring aspects of real life that are more frightening than the supernatural, but as a non-streaming man, I'm probably the complete opposite of who this game would resonate with most. That's not to say that I didn't find it very effective though. Women very often avoid being outside alone at night because of the possible dangers that await them specifically. They are also preyed upon more often in online spaces, which might appear to be more safe, but even if they are surrounded by thousands of viewers, they themselves are still fundamentally alone. The online element does add a social barrier between people, which acts as a safety net for many. The vast majority of people you interact with online you will never meet in real life, so you can rest assured that even if you do encounter a random weirdo, as soon as you log off they are out of your life. When this barrier is broken however, it's terrifying. Throughout the game, Nina believes one of her viewers has invaded her life, although we do come to discover that it was her ex Ricky at the whole time. The anonymity the user I Love Nina possesses is their most powerful tool for terrorising Nina. The simple fact that they know her to a disturbingly intimate degree and she has no idea who they are is the foundation for all the tension throughout the game. From her perspective, this person has come to both idolise and idealise her through watching her streams, latching onto her and considering her theirs in a completely one-sided manner. In a way, it's lucky that the user turned out to be someone she knows. The alternative would have been much more disturbing. That a complete stranger could so effectively infiltrate her life would mean it's possible for others to do the same just as easily. I like how this game tricks both the character and the player into thinking it's a genuine parasocial relationship gone wrong, only to reveal otherwise. It's a really well crafted narrative. The voyeuristic stalking that the protagonist is also subjected to in this game is genuinely sickening. To many, the thought of someone very real watching you, especially when you're in a vulnerable state like sleeping or bathing, is far more terrifying than a ghost could ever be. To add on to this, feeling like you have nobody to turn to when you need help is also terrifying. The fact that the only people Nina could ask for help were all conspiring against her is so disturbing, especially since she pushed away the only person who could help her because of the manipulation of one of the seemingly good-natured predators. There's so much to unpack in this game and it's all so messed up. Regardless of all this praise though, Parasocial unfortunately isn't as polished as the previous two games. There was a time when I returned to the apartment to find that the cityscape was completely different to what it had looked like during the day. There was also this moment where you see the person recording around the corner behind you at the end and I had two issues here. The first is that the hand just clips through the wall as it disappears, which kind of ruins the moment a bit. The second is that if you move beyond the corners in the game, the person doesn't, meaning the camera is just kind of floating invisibly in the air, and it also kind of ruins the moment. 
There's also the issue of the person being controllable as the game, but there being absolutely no lag between input on the PC and the action of the person. I will forgive that one though as it's a bit nitpicky. I also was not a fan of the stealth section where you need to sneak through the house to attack the man. On a technical level it worked, but the issues I have are mostly with the audio. For some reason the tense ambience that plays to increase the tension in this moment is so loud that you can barely hear the man's footsteps as he stalks the halls. This is the most important thing in this entire section, as it's the only way to locate him without getting caught. Well, except for this instant where he entered the room but didn't see me because I had been frozen still with fear. Maybe his eyesight is based on movement like a T-Rex. This whole stealth section was incredibly frustrating to get through due to how hard it is to judge his location to sneak up on him. Several times I emerged from the closet to attack him in the back only to discover he was facing towards me, which of course meant my death. Overall, Parasocial was an experience that didn't immediately stand out as being more enjoyable than Night Security, but it's definitely stuck with me for longer than that game has. This is primarily due to how effectively it realised the more common and relatable themes without losing the aspects that made them so disturbing. I've experienced encounters with ghosts and monsters in games, and even had an unexplainable incident in real life, but I find the thought of being stalked or manipulated or having my home invaded far scarier than anything else. In a sense, Chilla's Art's earlier games are equivalent to jump scares. They're momentary, fleeting experiences, while parasocial is slow-burning, traumatising horror that haunts your mind for weeks afterwards. It puts you in the shoes of someone experiencing something wholly horrific, unlike in Night Security where it's scary but still fun because of the spooky ghosts. It's just fucked. Straight fucked. And that will do it for this video. I'm genuinely surprised by the sheer leap of quality in this batch of games compared to the previous lot. Not only have Chilla's Art improved their horror elements, visuals and performance issues, but their storytelling is so much better now. They weren't opposed to touching on dark subject matter before, but I feel like they have gotten a lot better at actually exploring these themes. They seem to be skewing their games to less supernatural type of horror, and I think they're doing very well. It's easier to make a scary game when utilising ghosts, monsters and murderers, so the fact that they've created such emotionally impactful narratives with more real horrors like sexual assault, child abuse, stalking, emotional manipulation and infidelity is really impressive. And hey, even when they do go full paranormal horror like in Night Security, they go way harder than ever before. Even though I might miss the paranormal aspects of their previous games, I hope they continue on this route as I've enjoyed these three games a lot more than I expected to. This isn't to say that everyone will enjoy them as much as I did though. The caveat of exploring more relatable subjects is that people who have traumatic responses to them may not react well to the game. This probably isn't something Chilla's art are concerned about since relevant cases would be in the minority, but it does become more difficult to avoid unintentionally exposing more victims to these things. I'll do what I can to make sure my videos don't upset people going forward, especially if Chilla's Art continue making games focused on more human horrors, but I'm not the most socially sensitive person so let me know if I could do better. Anyway, I'm glad I returned to this series and I'm eager to play the next bunch of games, but until then, thanks for watching.